Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. On today's episode, we have Tim Smith, the CEO and founder of Wiglaf Pricing and author of Pricing Done Right and several other books. Thanks so much for joining us, Tim. Ah, thanks for having me, Gabe. Always fun to talk with PriceFX. For folks that don't know about Wiglaf Pricing or know you, even though you have a pretty large audience and uh, followers on, on LinkedIn and such, I'm sure some of our listeners may not know who you are. You want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do? I run a company called Wiglaf Pricing, and we're consultants. We help people uh, define prices, price structures, pricing organizations, pricing analytics. How do you actually get pricing into the organization leading to better decision making? That's that's what we're focused on. Nice. Yeah. And you've written a, a, a few books on the topic and you do a lot of, uh, you know, post a lot of content online as well. And your latest book is Pricing Done Right. And uh, you uh, mentioned before when we were talking about it that you had written more of the, the pricing strategy textbook approach. And now you wanted to move to a different approach in kind of the next book. Uh, took a different different tact. Do you want to talk a little bit about what what you're trying to accomplish there and why you decided to write it? So in the textbook, my goal was to help students learn how to do pricing so that if you start as a pricing manager or an analyst and you're new to the field, you know what you're supposed to be doing. What are the questions? What is the field of pricing defined as? And unfortunately, the extant books at the time were not very useful in teaching, so I needed a teaching textbook. Well, that's great. I can, you know, I've used it as being used around the world. People are learning how to do their job. Great. But the decision makers are the CEOs and their direct reports. The question they're facing isn't how do I do conjoint analysis or make a histogram? Their question they're asking is how do I improve my profits? What's going on? You say you're in pricing, you're going to help me make more money? Are you going to help me hit my objectives and revenue or whatever my objectives are? Well, what do I need? What do I need to hire? And uh, so the pricing done right was really written about the organizational requirements for driving pricing within a company. Yeah, very different approach. Indeed. So very practical though, right? And, And almost like a uh, a, a planning kind of guide or, or a very pragmatic type of uh, uh, guide for folks to to implement this in, in an organization as opposed to the theory and some something about the practice, right? Yeah, it was more practical. Uh, trying to define, well, the pricing department, how do they work with the other areas? What are the decision areas they should own? And in there, we developed the value-based pricing framework where it discusses pricing decisions starting from um, corporate strategy. How does my company fit into the competition and how do we win customers? Mm -hmm. How does pricing fit into that? And you can imagine the difference you would have on the corporate strategy of, say, L'Oreal versus um, Estee Lauder in terms of their uh, competition strategy Mm -hmm. or Tesla versus GM. Moving on into price strategy itself, pricing strategy, many people just say it's skim neutral penetrate. That's part of it, not disagreeing with that. But I'm I'm also thinking that pricing strategy includes the structure. Like, are you doing a two-part tariff, a tying arrangement, subscriptions, bundling, versioning, revenue management? How do these things fit together? How is your business defining the way at which customers can self-segment and choose to interact with you through the price. Uh, a third area in terms of strategy is you have your list of competition. How do you actually react to your competitor's price moves? When do you react? When do you not? How, how does it affect when you're looking at the other areas? And then the uh, fourth area on pricing strategy includes the people, process, and tools. It's nice to say I want to have go to the moon. It's another thing to build a rocket ship. I mean, you actually have to get in there, and people need to be trained. After that, it goes into market pricing. You know how to set the price on a pair of glasses like this, or price variance analysis. Who gets what discount or rebate when? How do we actually control that? And finally, we get to uh, price execution. Okay, I have a plan. How do I make sure I actually do what I said I wanted to do? 
people do make mistakes still. I think you've seen that at PriceFX. Very costly mistakes. I've seen a few. I've seen a few. Um, yeah, I was just uh, I was just on this uh, someone else's uh, uh, blog or, or a podcast and blog about uh, actually on MIT's. Uh, it was called "In Machines We Trust," and I was talking about an example that I had seen in some research I had done where they had a wasn't it wasn't a very costly mistake, but it was a pretty amusing one because it was two pricing algorithms that were acting autonomously but keying off each other. And they increased the price of this textbook on like fly genetics up to like one point two million dollars just because it was just operating unchecked. Right. So you could imagine if that was happening at scale across a portfolio of products, the kind of havoc that that could wreak. Um, but, uh, you know, luckily, yeah, go ahead. That actually happened to me, not to yeah. one point two million dollars, but I have a fifty dollar textbook on, on basic uh, math in marketing. OK, statistics applied to marketing. Or you can call it machine learning and, and artificial intelligence for marketing decision making. I think that's what the title was. It got bid up on Amazon up to over four, three, three and a half thousand dollars. And this wow. is a book I can sell to anybody for 50 bucks. All they have to do is ask me. But yeah, yeah, I've seen this happen in real life. It's like these bots, no, nah, they're not necessarily. Black box decision making isn't always a good way to go forward here. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we we advocate more of a clear box approach and it's more of a machine guided human led rather than machine led human audited. Right. And yeah, yeah, because uh, it's it's dangerous. And especially and those those kind of the more deep learning and neural network, uh, you know, algorithms really only work where there's really good transparency and very high volume and low risk of making a mistake. Right. So. Yeah, someone goes to look at the three and a half thousand dollar textbook. They decide not to buy it. Okay, that would have been fifty dollars out of your pocket, you know. But but if you're you know if you're doing that across your whole portfolio and and the, the deals are you know three and a half million dollars and you either win it or lose it, then that's a different story, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's more of our customers fall into that where, um, and it, it's interesting though because I think because of what people see with Uber and Amazon and Lyft and you know airline pricing, they have this sense that. AI for pricing is always that it's always, you know, some just black box, you know, neural network that should be just spitting out a price. And we get a lot of these questions on, oh, how does it learn and how to do this? And I'm like, we're not trying to replace you as a pricing team. We're trying to augment what you do and make you more effective and more efficient at what you do by automating a lot of the processes and then and providing you guidance into those into those things. But, you know, the machine only knows whatever data you feed it. It doesn't know that oh, there's a supply chain disruption that just happened yesterday. It's looking at, you know, two years worth of data to try to figure out certain trends, but it, it, it's not going to sense that spike. Um, or oh, I've got a new competitor that's doing this to me as of last week, right? It's going to, you're going to be able to react much more quickly and, and flex your strategy and tactics. Um, and I, I think, you know, part of what we're seeing right now, you know, with regards to all the change that's happening is, the understanding by a lot of companies that pricing can be used as a strategic lever, not only to drive more profit and more revenue, but also as one of the key strategic elements of how you want to you know, operate your business, right? Like you were talking about some of those things when you're talking about your book, like, okay, subscription pricing. When you, when you come up, when you move to a subscription, you have a, the opportunity to completely re-examine your relationship with your customer. And the pricing is just one of those aspects. But the, the pricing really, it gives you the opportunity to look at, okay, how much, what value are they actually getting and, and how do I want to be monetized during my relationship and hopefully for a long time by coming up with something that's fair and how, how much of that value should I be taking, right, as, as in price, right? That's always, a, you know, a, a kind of a, an interesting question to ask and, and to have answered. And a lot of it depends on how, you know, how competitive that market is how much transparency there is, how the, the switching costs and, you know, elasticity and all these other things kind of combined. So it's a pretty fascinating topic pricing. I think you and I would both agree that, uh, I, I think I fell in love with it when I learned about it. So there yeah. I am. You, you also, uh, you, you're also a professor, right? You, you talked about some, or you have been, I don't know. Are you currently a professor still or? I am. I started teaching in DePaul back in 2003. And I'm still teaching there, just much, much less than I used to because I'm spending most of my time consulting, not teaching. But I still teach. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember that Chicagoland event that we did over at DePaul that you had hosted a, a while back. And you're doing those now over at, uh, is the Union Club? Is that right? Union League Club of Union. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I hope to see you at the next one there. And uh, it's in January, right? Coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we're planning on on attending that. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things we're seeing? So I mentioned, you know, pricing as a strategic lever and some of the current trends. Obviously, one of the big ones is around inflation, right? That's happening right now. I just wrote uh, a little white paper on, you know, using dynamic pricing to, to help uh, avoid margin compression that, that uh, you know, both manufacturers and distributors are experiencing as a result of, of you know, inflation. Um, you know, it is cooling down a little bit, but I think it's, it seems like it's kind of here to stay when you pump as much money into the system as there has been. And, and, uh, you know, you get all these shortages and, and, you know, prices are going to go up and you really have to be able to respond to that. Um, you, you had made some points in our conversation last week about, you know, food production and kind of the, some of the conundrum that some of these, uh, CPG companies find themselves in with regards to pricing, uh, and, and how it's, uh, Difficult for them now to to react because of their you know their strategies and tactics that they've established. Do, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Well, inflation in the states and in Western Europe may be at five percent or so this year, and over the past decades they were closer to two percent or zero. Uh, the fact of dealing with inflation is never going to go away because Argentina, well, for the past ten years roughly, they've been enjoying extremely high inflation in double digits, as well as Turkey more recently. And so if you're working internationally, you realize you're gonna to have to deal with inflation on a regular basis. Uh, the question is, is how? And this is where I'm seeing some organizations just caught flat-footed. And what, one of the problems of dealing with inflation, if you're just doing based upon historical practices, is that's how you're going to manage your prices? Well, your historical practice doesn't make sense when there's been a step change from inflation going from zero to five. Suddenly now you have to raise prices, but so do your competitors. And so your elasticity issue saying, if I raise prices, my customers will all go to the competitors, now flip into, well, yeah, well, that's not quite true. The real issue is, are your competitors raising price at the same time? Or how is the industry managing this problem? I was reading about Darden. Uh, it's a restaurant group that thinks, you know, long, long, Lone Star Steakhouse or Longhorn Roadhouse, I don't recall. They also have like a Red Lobster and a few other chain restaurants. The CEO was expressing great fear about raising prices on these, fat, you know, casual dining restaurants, et cetera. And I'm just thinking, well, your cost of labor just went up. Your cost of ingredients just went up. Now, maybe your property cost did not increase, but still, that's two out of three of basically running your organization. You can't just absorb it and expect to have a productive and fruitful future. You have to pass it on to the customers at some level. And the question is just how much and when. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think we've, uh, yeah, we've become accustomed, uh, you know, to eating out quite a lot in America. And, uh, you know, I was just watching a, a, a show the other day where they're talking about this talk show. And, and uh, they were saying, you know, when I was growing up, and, and this was the case for me, too, we didn't eat out very often at all. You know, we, we would eat out maybe once a week. We'd go to Denny's, I think, on Sundays. That was about like the only regular time that we would eat out. But, you know, Denny's was, what, $2 for a Grand Slam or whatever. It was almost cheaper than making it at home. But I think that kind of model... Um, doesn't seem very sustainable in today's environment, right? When you talk about the inflation, not only and, and the labor, the increase in labor costs and the labor shortages that are going on, because the that's one thing that I think COVID's really done is expose the, you know, the the challenges around um, finding labor in in this environment where you've got people on the front lines that don't want to be on the front lines. They're getting you know harassed because they have to be the enforcer of some of these policies. They're you know, and they're they're you know on the front lines with regards to getting exposed, and and then they're getting these you know on the flip side you know pretty generous uh, you know packages when they're not working at least for you know so no wonder it's hard for them to find people right and especially in the states where they're not even paying minimum wage um, because of you know 
I think there's a bunch of states that are still paying people two dollars and thirteen cents an hour or something like this for a minimum wage when they get tips. So it's a uh, yeah, it's inevitable. I, I think that and and obviously the the fear though is in those companies that that people will eat out less and and I think that's inevitable too. Actually, I mean with regards to you know all the where this is all going to go because you know you've got to people's most people's incomes are not going up at the rate of inflation. Most people didn't get a five percent plus raise this year, right? Um, and that's, that's, therein lies the challenge, right? In terms of, uh, you know, consumers will have less money to spend, uh, behaviors are going to have to change. People are going to start saving, you know, saving more, eating at home more and, uh, and not, you know, uh, exercising as much, uh, discretionary spending as because they can't afford to, right? Things are changing, but they'll always be changing. And yeah, yeah. that's true. I mean, at some point that's going to reverse course and things right. will change back. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's the key. I think, in when we think about pricing as a strategic lever, in my mind, you know, to you you have to think about really it's about business agility. Um, is like how you know because things are you know before before COVID happened, it was all about the trade and tariff wars and and then you know and then the recession and you know uh, at the beginning of of COVID and then we came back so quickly from it. It was like obviously you know that that combined with the quantitative easing is what's driving a lot of the inflation. So. Uh, but yeah, at some point that's going to change and then you're going to need to be able to f- be flexible in the other direction. So. And I think that's where some companies have been caught off guard. Business agility requires investment, investment in people, process, and tools. You can't just suddenly flip on pricing in these organizations. Now, right. When I'm looking at large manufactured consumer product goods company with the pricing department still being basically two people with an Excel spreadsheet, running elasticity analysis and they're doing, you know, 10, 15 billion dollars a year of business with that model. And then suddenly you have this real problem come up. Inflation is no longer zero. We need to do something. And they didn't have the intellectual they didn't have the intellectual capital within their organization to drive better decisions. They didn't have the people. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have the software. They were kept you know, caught flat footed. And I'm yeah. looking at, you know, quick serve restaurants and and uh, some of your food manufacturers. You just wonder how are how did they get this big with such bad pricing policies? Yeah. Well, yeah, to a large extent it's been because they focus so heavily on promotions, right? So because that promotion line item at most CPG companies is something like 15 to 20 percent of their revenue. So for a 10 to 15 billion a company dollar company, that's two or three billion dollars that they're spending. So they're investing a whole lot of time and effort and people and process and systems in managing their trade promotion spend. Right. But there are a lot of them just view. Oh, no, that's that's just the price on the shelf that I don't change. I only change that once a year. Right. So why do I need a bunch of people looking at that? They're not flexing it by channels. But those days are gone because. You know, first of all, the 2020 and very, very much was the year of, of direct to consumer, right? So the, the, there's never been a higher investment in, in any of these companies around going directly to consumers. But even beyond that, they're operating in all these different channels. So selling through Amazon on their website, through traditional retailers, um, you know, through all these different models that they may not have ever done before. So it really requires a much more holistic thinking around price and promotions working together, right? And I think that's what we're starting to see happen. But you're right. Like most of the companies are not they're not organized in a way to really think. And, and they don't have the, the tools or the people that, you know, or the or the processes to think about pricing in that in that more holistic sense. I think that the uh, hotels, airlines, they've done I mean, they've really gone far on the revenue management approach, Absolutely. which is good for them. Yeah. B2B, I actually think, has taken further advances in driving forward pricing than I think B to C or CPG type companies. It's hard for me to look at a billion dollar manufacturing company and not find at least some semblance of a pricing department. Mm-hmm. Maybe with just three people in it, but it's non-zero. Even companies reaching 200 million are starting to look at building a small pricing department with the little pricing analytics in the in the B2B sector. And it's just it, it's it remarks partly on the work that has been happening for the past 20 years or so, B2B price setting, price management. It also reflects the 
importance of finance over pure branding in the B2B sector. So we have a bit more power in thinking, what do I want? Revenue, profit, or market share? And mm -hmm. profit comes up a bit higher on the priority list in the B2B sectors. Indeed, indeed. Well, it depends on who you ask, because a lot of times you ask, you know, finance, so they're going to say profit. You ask sales, so they're going to say revenue. You ask the CEO, so they're going to say both. And that's actually something. That, yeah, yeah I think we both experienced that. Yeah. Uh, but it's not as bad. And, and this is like, think about the B2B, B2C area. Uh, you have Amazon, which I don't think made money for 15, 20 years of its first they, beginning. They still don't make money on their retail, actually. They did make all their money on the AWS, really. So it's a pretty interesting business model they pivoted their so way. They went after nothing but size, and they got well rewarded for it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Tesla didn't make money for the first seven to 10 years either. And now it's the most valuable brand in automotive. Yeah. You look at a bunch of startups run with good names behind them, and they can grow for a long time just going after size, not actual money. Now, you look at a bootstrap startup, which is, you know, wig laugh right here. No, we're after money every single day. I can't just go for size. I'd love to be a huge firm, but realistically, I got to make money and I can't give away the, the barn. I got to make money on this. So it's yeah. a different attitude of what is drives your financial metrics, meaning the CEO's pocketbook. Is it yeah. profitability? And you definitely see that with Carol Tomei of uh, UPS. She's trying to increase the profitability of all of her assets. Or is it pure revenue? And that would be Amazon, just trying to be the biggest thing in the planet. Or is it uh, market share, which I think would be how you would describe Kellogg's or Post or any mm -hmm. branded cereal maker? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, from my perspective as well, coming from you know a big company like Cisco Systems, where I started my career, and we were, but we were very much in you know in that hyper growth mode. Even though we were already a large company when I joined, but we were, you know, the category leader, and we were defining that whole networking space at the time. And it was just it was all about you know, like as you mentioned, it's all about growth, right? It wasn't really so much about. It was, I mean, we were starting to get into profit mode, but as I was there, we started to get into it. When I started at Price Effects, we were actually bootstrapped for the first six years of our existence. So we're about 10 years in now, and we've raised something like $130 million. But um, but when when I started, we had raised zero dollars, except for friends and family. I I actually personally invested in Price Effects to stake the expansion into the U.S. Um, and so and that ended up being a pretty good investment. But the, that's not the point. The point is that we were bootstrapped and we were very much like, you know, worried about cash flow and, and profitability. And we were actually profitable. Uh, I think three out of our first six years, we were profitable as, as a bootstrap startup, which is pretty irregular in the, in the software industry. Um, but since then, obviously, we're, you know, we've raised capital and we're running at a loss to, in order to gain share and, and to grow, um, which, you know, s seems to be working fairly well so far. So, but at some point, you know, there's this in, in software, there's this rule of 40, right? So it's like, basically, when you look at your, your, uh, your evident margin, right? And your growth, um, the two of those things together should be around 40%. So if you're growing zero, and you're a 40% profitability, you're doing okay. Or if you're, if you're, you know, at zero margin, but you're growing about 40%, then you're okay. Or if you're growing at 80%, and you're at negative 40%, then you're okay. So that's kind of an interesting metric that our, our CFO looks at and and uses to help measure you know our business and i i won't comment on where we are there but um because that's a, we're a private company so i shouldn't get too much into our financials but <laughs> yeah but i i work with a lot of startups in the software space too uh, yeah. and i see it very clearly where they say we want a price structure and price guidance that tells us where we should expect the deals to land Yet at the end of the day, if the deal looks good, I don't care what we get, just close it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on our, you know, we have two, you know, two parts of our business. Um, you know, there's the the subscription side and then the implementation or services side. Um, we care much more about profitability on the services side of the business because, you know, that is, I mean, we kind of view that as 
a bit of a necessary evil in in the way that um, sorry if, if I'm offending anyone in our services organization, but I think that they realize we want to keep that as small as possible. One of the things um, that mistakes that some software companies in our space have made is over invested on the services side of the business and become really reliant on that revenue. And when you do that, you actually start becoming more of a consulting organization from a culture perspective. And and you, because you have this big bench and you're always concerned with, okay, how do I, you know, how do I get Deploy these resources? this resource? Yeah. Exactly. And so we've been very cognizant to not do that. Um, uh, and, and we've always viewed that, that side of the business as, yes, it needs to run, you know, autonomously. We don't want to be pumping money into it. But at the same time, we don't care a ton about, you know, it making money. That's traditionally how we viewed it. But now that we're thinking, you know, now that we have more ambitions of, of the, you know, our future and what we're going to be doing there. Um, we are looking at as more of a, you know, the profitability on that side. But I mean, the beautiful thing about software is that the variable cost on the, on the, you know, on the subscription side are, are pretty minimal, right. Um, outside of, you know, paying salespeople and, you know, running the software, but, um, you know, that's, that's the nice thing about being able to scale, but the other part side of the business doesn't scale. So, you know, we want to scale through, through partners, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we 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 want our services organization to actually become a partner enablement organization, right? And so, come whether it's smaller partners like like Wiglaf or or larger partners, you know, we we really want uh, a lot of the the work, you know, both this obviously the strategy we never want to get into that, but even the the implementation side and the integration side, um, you know, we want to we want partners to be doing that work going forward, and and you know, that's that. That's how the most successful enterprise software companies have grown into what they are, right? And uh, that's not lost on us. But it's uh, that that reflects it in itself in the way that we price and and how we look at deals and how we model profitability as well.